Hello and welcome to Tech Deals. Overclocking the i7-8700K on the $2,000 Cadillac build. This video is a bit different than my traditional videos. You can see I'm no longer at my normal filming desk. I'm actually downstairs where I'm going to be doing my future benchmarking. I've got a normal monitor hooked up in just a minute. I'm going to zoom in and I'm going to show you some of the different BIOS options and multiple ways to overclock your CPU. I'll also touch on RAM overclocking and we'll take a look at temperatures and stress testing in this video as well. Now, if you've not seen my other videos, on this build, there'll be a full playlist link down in the video description below, the parts overview, very detailed Y vlogs of all the different parts and alternative selections, a detailed step-by-step -step build video itself, and then of course, this video, which hopefully you're watching right now. Before overclocking your new CPU, there's a couple of things to keep in mind. First of all, the out-of-the-box speeds. 3.8 gigahertz base clock speed, 4.7 gigahertz turbo speed. That's a fairly wide spread. But what a lot of people may not realize is that the 3.8 gigahertz base speed is really never going to be reached unless you have inadequate cooling. It's all core turbo speed is 4.3 gigahertz. So assuming you have adequate cooling, which we most certainly do with a 240 millimeter liquid cooler, the CPU is always going to run at least 4.3 gigahertz when under load. Now the clock speed will drop way down when it's not being used, that's power saving, but under load, it's gonna run at least 4.3. Now it only is going to run at 4.7, when you're using one core. And then there's a stage drop down, 4.4 on four cores, 4.5 on three, and stuff like that. Now, it is worth noting that you don't actually have to technically overclock the CPU to get more performance. Most motherboards have some sort of option, either an all core boost speed or an automatic turbo boosting speed that lets you get to the max turbo on all the cores. I'll show you that in just a minute. But they are of course fully overclockable and I'll show you five gigahertz as well. I have now zoomed the camera in on the monitor and this right here is the first BIOS screen that you're gonna see when you first turn on the computer and press the delete key to enter the BIOS setup. Now I said 3.8 gigahertz base before, I meant 3.7, my apologies. Um, this is the standard default configuration. The uh, optimized defaults are loaded, so this is what you should see or something very similar to it when you first turn on the machine. You can see our DDR speed here is 2133. That's because XMP is turned off. We will turn that on in just a minute. This is the non-advanced screen. You have to press F7 to go into the advanced screen. But if you just want to explore, you can come down to memory. You can see we're at 2133 at the moment. You can see that we have an XMP profile of 3200, but it's not actually currently loaded at the moment. You can come down and see the storage configuration. You may have M2 devices. You may have SATA devices. If you have an Optane device, there are configuration options for that, but a machine of this level should have a straight SSD, not an Optane drive. If you have not updated your BIOS, it may be worth doing so. The M flash option right here is how you update the BIOS within the BIOS. You need to download it from MSI's website onto a USB thumb drive, put it in, reboot, go into the BIOS, click here. You can see your current BIOS version here, which is uh, in this case, A00, that is the launch BIOS. There actually are an updated BIOS for this motherboard, I just haven't put them in yet. Pressing F7 will take us into the advanced menu. Here you can see the advanced system menu. Now, settings, overclocking, another button here to click M flash using USB to flash BIOS, a board explorer option which lets you explore all the various ports and items on the board, hardware monitoring, that's fan control, and then you can actually save different overclock profiles and save and load them rather than have to re-enter them manually. This is an overclocking video, so I'm not going to cover every option in every menu here, but I am going to make one suggestion, and there will be a similar setting to this in each brand motherboard. Go into settings, come down to the advanced option, come down to Windows OS configuration, turn on Windows 10 WHQL support. It will also enable fast boot. This will make your computer boot much more quickly and it also enables support of some advanced options that Windows 10 supports. In the rest of these here, you can turn on and off USB options, integrated peripherals, the onboard sound, which when I install a sound card, I'll disable, um, and various other settings. But for now, we're not going to worry about that. We're going to come back to settings and we're gonna come down to overclock. If you have never overclocked a, a system before, this can look intimidating. Please note, and this is an important disclaimer, you can destroy your CPU based upon things that you enter into this screen. 
So be aware of the fact that you don't want to just experiment if you don't know what you're doing. The, a simple example of this would be if we come down to CPU voltage. CPU core voltage right here is currently 1.128 volts. If we were to set that to say 1.8 volts and reboot the machine, we wouldn't have a computer anymore. Actually, it may not take it. Uh, it, it probably will limit it to 1.52 that could fry your chip. That is way, way too much voltage. The absolute maximum voltage that I personally would use is 1.4 volts, but 1.35 is a much safer number. Now, how much overclock you get at 1.35 is going to vary from chip to chip. You certainly can go over that, but you're doing so at your own risk and you're reducing the life of the CPU, or at least risking the life of the CPU. With that disclaimer out of the way, this right here is the extreme memory profile. Now, this should always be safe to activate. And all it does is activate the onboard memory overclock profile. You can see up here, the DRAM speed went, well, it went away, but it went to 3200 megahertz using the onboard uh, serial presence detect of the memory modules, 16, 18, 18, 38 at 1.35 volts. And so the memory is now overclocked. Notice the XMP button is turned on. You could have actually just clicked this and done the same thing, but I wanted to show it to you in the BIOS. Now let me go back up to the top and go through these one by one. I have now brought it back up to the top of the menu. I want to go through each of these one at a time. One of the simplest and easy ways to overclock your CPU is to come to the CPU ratio number right here. You can type in a number, and this is a clock multiplier. If we type in 40 and press enter, it will set the CPU to 4 gigahertz. Please note, this does not allow it to boost to 4.3 or to 4.7 gigahertz. That's a fixed 4 gigahertz. We can set 4.4 gigahertz by typing in 44, and that will set it to 4,400 4, megahertz. Please note that nothing you type into the screen actually takes effect until you press F10 to save and reboot. So you can type stuff in here and nothing will happen until you actually save and reboot. If you want an easy, safe overclock, typing in 47 takes it to the max turbo of the chip, 4.7 gigahertz. Most people using a 240 millimeter liquid cooler or similar large tower cooler should be able to get 4.7 gigahertz. This is on all six cores, mind you, not just one, without having to adjust voltage. Down here, leave voltage on auto. Now it will go up a little bit as the motherboard increases it with clock speed, but it's not gonna go very high, it's gonna be just fine. So if you want a safe overclock, you can certainly come over here and you can set this to 4.7 gigahertz and you should have a safe overclock. If you wanna set this back to auto, simply type in an A and press enter and it puts it back to the auto speeds, how the CPU works out of the box with 3.7 base and a 4.7 max turbo. Now I mentioned earlier, there's an easy way to overclock using automatic max turbo settings. Most boards have this ASUS, MSI, I'm pretty sure Gigabyte does, although I haven't used it personally. If you come down here to the miscellaneous setting option and expand it, Enhanced Speed Step is activated. Intel Turbo Boost is activated. Enhanced Turbo is an MSI feature. It's currently set to Auto. Bring that down to Enabled. If you bring this to Enabled, it will do Max Turbo on all six cores. This basically turns your CPU into a 4.7 gigahertz all-core turbo speed. I played around with this earlier. I did test it. That is what that does, and it works just fine. I can also tell you that leaving all the settings at default except for the XMP and turning this to enabled, this runs no problem whatsoever at 4.7 gigahertz on all six cores. If you want a simple, easy overclock without pushing your system too hard, this is how you do it. If you're done at this point, if you're happy with this overclock setting, you would press F10 and it confirms what changes will be made. There's the Windows 10 uh, support that I turned on earlier, fast boot is enabled, enhanced turbo is to enabled, and extreme memory profile or XMP is enabled. Now if you hit yes and reboot, you're done. Your system should be fine. Now I still recommend running some stress testing, which I'm going to show you later in this video, but this should work for 99.9 .9 plus percent of everybody who builds a system even remotely similar to this one. But for now, we're going to choose no because I want to show you some additional options. I mentioned the CPU ratio was for the CPU itself. The CPU ratio offset is an important one. 
If you decide to go, for example, for a 5 gigahertz overclock, fair enough. Many of you with sufficient cooling may get a 5 gigahertz overclock with no AVX offset. AVX, by the way, is an extremely demanding part of the instruction set. The new AVX 512 instructions are particularly adept at H.265 uh, or 4K encoding. But it's worth noting that many times a CPU will overclock to a higher number when AVX is set to a lower number. Many people may have to set this, for example, to AVX minus 3. What this does is under normal circumstances, it runs your CPU at 5 gigahertz. When the AVX instructions are being used, which is not actually that often, but if they're being used, it slows the CPU down to 4.7 gigahertz. It's lowering the clock multiplier in order to keep your system stable. Ring ratio is an advanced setting that frankly, I don't think most people should mess with. Leave it on auto. I mentioned EIST, Enhanced uh, Intel Speed Step Technology. Basically, this is power saving. This allows the CPU to uh, raise and lower the clock speed as needed based upon workload. Very few people should disable it. Only extreme, extreme overclockers and people going for records should disable that. Notice that Intel Turbo Boost is grayed out when you type in a CPU ratio. That is because a CPU ratio overrides that. There's no turbo when you manually type in a number. This is why, quite frankly, if you're going to go for 4.7, leave that on auto and just turn Enhanced Turbo on. This lets the system handle the CPU speed. Coming down here, we have Base Clock uh, Multiplier. This is not a necessary setting to mess with because we have an unlocked CPU. In years past with locked CPUs, Base Clock was used to multiply the clock speed. If we were to type in 110, for example, it actually, it's the, see the 50 is a multiplier of the Base Clock. This would give us a 5.5 gigahertz clock speed. There's no way in the world the CPU is going to run at 5.5 gigahertz, so that would certainly not work. If we were limited, for example, to 4.7, that would actually give us a 5.17 gigahertz clock speed. That might work maybe with a 280 cooler. It's probably not going to work with a 240. You could certainly set this to 105. There's no need to do this. Because we have unlocked multipliers, leave this at 100. It's meant to run at 100. It's happy running at 100. Leave that at 100. The only people who might consider using this are people who are using locked CPUs rather than unlocked CPUs. I have, by the way, not actually personally tested whether or not base clock overclocking works on the locked coffee lakes. It has intermittently worked and not worked on previous generation of non-K chips. I have not actually played with it this time around because frankly, if you want to overclock, buy K-chip. For now, I'm going to turn off the ratio of AVX because we're going to test at 5 gigahertz without it. I have now scrolled the page down. You can see the DRAM setting is now up on the top. Now, there are various other options here. Notice we have an A to 64 memory boost option. Don't mess with that. That's for people going for world records and other tests. There's a memory tried option. If by chance you have memory, that is not XMP certified, which is unlikely, but if you do, this actually allows the motherboard to go through a series of reboots and to test your memory and to see what it can get. You shouldn't have to mess with this. If you're using memory that has an XMP profile, it's been tested and certified to work at that speed on Intel boards. Not AMD, but we have an Intel system, so XMP works. I recommend using it. If you do want to experiment, you have various settings in the Try It option here. Now, for the memory I have installed, which is not, this is not Samsung BDI, this is uh, Hynix memory, you have various options. Now, this is DDR4 3200 megahertz CL16. You can also set it to DDR4 3600 CL18. Higher CLs are worse, higher clock speeds are better. You trade the CL, which is basically latency, for a higher clock speed. If you want to, you can set it, it'll, it'll, it'll test it and see whether or not it works. But frankly, if you wanted faster speed, buy faster RAM. The average person does not need to mess with advanced DRAM configuration. I mean, certainly you can. This is where you can go in and change all the various detailed sub timings and settings for memory. This is for advanced users, way beyond the scope of what I do on my channel. I'm just mentioning what it is. Now coming here down to the voltage settings, the only voltage setting that most people should consider touching is this one, the CPU core voltage. I personally recommend that you do not go beyond 1.35. 1.35 should be a safe number for everybody. If you want to push it, you can go to 1.4. Notice the number turns red when you go to 1.4. 
That is a danger sign. That's letting you know that that's too much. You can go to 1.375, it still turns red. 1.45, very red. Now, please note, will it work at 1.45? Yes, but you are affecting the life of your CPU. How much is an unknown? You're talking about varying degrees of additional wear and the more voltage you give the CPU, the more temperature you're going to get. It's worth noting that as you increase the voltage to get a higher overclock, you're also increasing the temperature. Going from 4.7 to 5 gigahertz to 5.3 gigahertz does not actually increase temperature all that much. It's the voltage increase that has to go along with that clock speed that really causes the temperature to rise. If you could keep the voltage down at 1.25 volts, and it would be stable at 5.3 gigahertz, you wouldn't have a temp problem at all. The problem is there's no way in the world you're gonna get 5.3 gigahertz at 1.25 volts. The system would simply not be stable. So as the clock speed increases, the voltage has to increase. My advice is to leave this on auto the first time you try it. In overclocking, if you wanna go beyond the max turbo speed of the CPU, if you wanna go beyond 4.7 gigahertz, you may suffer some hard locks and resets having to physically power off the machine, reboot, and go back into the BIOS and try again. It can take a whole afternoon, a whole day, or even several days of testing and burn-in testing to find the maximum overclock of a CPU at any given voltage. If you wanna see what 1.375 will get you or 1.4 will get you, yes, you could absolutely come up here and maybe you'll get 5.1 with a negative two offset. Maybe you'll get 5.2 with a negative 3 offset using 1.4 or 1.42 or 1.415 volts. Please note, the, the actual real-world performance difference between 4.9, 5.1, or even 5.3 gigahertz is minor. As you increase the speed of the CPU, please note that you get diminishing returns. Nothing else in the system gets any faster. Your RAM is not faster, your storage, your graphics card, nothing else is getting faster but the CPU. So yes, it helps, but you're only getting so much from this. If I can be completely honest with you, the vast majority of you honestly should do this. Auto, 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 enhanced turbo on, easy 4.7 gigahertz, great performance. The actual performance difference between 4.7 and 5 gigahertz is negligible. Yes, it shows up in benchmarks. You'll never notice it in the real world. Just make sure that your voltage down here is on auto when you do it. And this is the first setting actually that we're going to save, reboot, and run ADA64 stress test, and I'll show you the temperatures. So you can see here all the settings that are gonna be changed. I pressed F10. Basically, the only thing we've done is turn enhanced turbo on, the XMP memory profile on, and the w, Windows 10 WHQL support on. We have now booted into Windows 10 and have loaded up ADA64. ADA64 has a free trial that you can download. Download the Extreme Edition, which is the general consumer edition, and then you'll go into the menu option and choose Stress Test. This is the system stability test, and you can use this during the free trial. By default, the first four items here are checked, CPU, FPU, cache, and system memory. You can see down here all six core clocks. You can see cooling fans, temperature, CPU cores, etc. All you have to do is click start and let it run. Everything up to this point in this video was actually recorded back in December. The date you see on the screen is correct. This part here is being voiced over February 19th. This video sat unused for a while because, well, frankly, I put the machine on my Twitch streaming station, started using it, and never looked back. I did several tests on this, and I'm going to show you some footage from that in a second, but here's the short, short version. 4.7 gigahertz on all six cores runs fine, so long as you're not trying to run ADA64 stress testing. I've actually found it to be stable and reasonable in terms of temperatures for actually playing games. The settings you're seeing here are how the computer's actually configured to this day. All of the benchmarking, the videos, the live streams I've done on Twitch is how this machine is set up right here. 4.7 gigahertz enhanced turbo, voltage on auto, which actually doesn't run at 1.35. You can see here it's running about 1.33, give or take, but it is thermal throttling in ADA64. Interestingly enough, when you turn the FPU test off, which turns the AVX instructions off, this actually runs at five gigahertz without a problem. 
It's just that AVX crushes it, even at 4.7. A 240 millimeter liquid cooler, to be frank, in a less than ideal airflow case, such as the one I have it installed here, isn't enough for five gigahertz. Stick this in a larger case with better airflow with a 280 millimeter cooler or a Dark Rock Pro 3, and it will do the job just fine. What you are now looking at is a five gigahertz overclock, 1.30 volts fixed setting, no AVX offset, but it's a very important point to note, I'm only stressing the CPU, the FPU, the cache, and the system memory are unchecked. If we check those, we'll blue screen the computer. Not right away, but after several minutes of running. I've tried this a couple of times, it blue screens. But right now, what you're seeing is what you'd get in most, but not all games. Battlefield 1 would probably blue screen under these settings, but GTA 5 would not. I don't consider that to be a stable setting. My particular CPU, and this is my press sample by the way, if you're curious, it's not one of the retail chips, at 1.30 is simply not stable at 5 gigahertz. It is at 4.7, but at 5 gigahertz, it's happy at 1.35 volts and runs fine on everything at that setting. But this cooler will not cool at that setting. It overtemps and thermal throttles. Just to be clear, I previously had the Dark Rock Pro 3 installed on this motherboard in that other case, which I previously covered in my Be Quiet video. On that cooler, on this board with this exact CPU, 5 gigahertz, 1.35, 5 gigahertz, no AVX offset, no crashes, ran everything perfectly, no complaints. So we simply don't have enough cooling to run at 5 gigahertz. Just to note how demanding that AVX instructions and FPU instructions are, the max temp we've hit is 83 on our third core, which is the hottest core on this particular chip. We hit 100 at 4.7 gigahertz with the AVX testing turned on. Here, we're not even hitting 85 degrees C at 5 gigahertz, but that's without the FPU being tested. I have now stopped that test and I am now running it with all four of them checked and it immediately failed. Hardware failure detected. That didn't even last seven seconds. Um, we over -temped. It simply won't do five gigahertz, not at 1.3 volts. Now, if we increase it, we just thermal throttle. Now here we are in the BIOS. You can see I have a five gigahertz overclock selected. I am going to come down you can see I have 1.30 volts and it simply failed. At 1.35, it won't fail, but it will thermal throttle. We are now back up into Windows at 1.35 volts. We're running at five gigahertz with no AVX offset and we are testing all four of the checkboxes. We're already at 93 degrees C and it shouldn't take very long to hit 100 and then the CPU will start throttling. We just got our first throttle on core number four. It went down to 4.7 gigahertz briefly. Core number one went down to 4.8 briefly. This is protection built into the CPU to keep it from damaging itself. This core just dropped down to 4.2 briefly. That's at 4.6. So the cores are slowing themselves down as they over temp. In theory, you should never damage your CPU doing this. 1.35 volts won't damage your CPU. However, temps will, which is why the CPU is throttling itself. There's 4.0 there. So what will happen is you overclock to 5 gigahertz and you think you have a good performance. The reality is it will run, but it will then hitch and slow down. And so you'll wonder, why is my performance not that great when I'm overclocking? You might be thermal throttling. This will do this all day long without crashing but you're not actually running at five gigahertz. And if we were to load up Battlefield 1, performance would be very uneven because the clock speeds would constantly be jumping around as the CPU attempts to protect itself via thermal throttling. You are much better off setting 4.7 gigahertz at 1.3 volts and getting a stable, smooth clock speed without throttling than trying to get five gigahertz and having the CPU clock speed jump all over the place. Hopefully that has been interesting and useful to you. By all means, if you have questions or thoughts, put those down in the comments below. A few more of my final thoughts on this system. If you really want five gigahertz, it's the wrong setup. You really either need a large tower cooler such as the Noctura D15 or the Dark Rock Pro 3, or you need a 280 or 360 millimeter cooler. The 240 is not cutting it, at least not on this particular CPU. But because I know this CPU will do five gigahertz at 1.35 volts without thermal throttling on a Dark Rock Pro 3 because I had it there, it's the cooler's fault. And please note that it wouldn't make any difference whether we used 
an NZXT, a Corsair, a Cooler Master, all the 240s cool very similar within a degree or two of each other. None of them are gonna make enough of a difference to change the outcome of this. So if 4.7 gigahertz is good enough for you, then by all means, get the 240. Otherwise, plan on something larger. Now, if I still wanted to build in this case, but wanted to fit a Dark Rock Pro 3, I have a solution. 32 gigs using two 16 gig dims. I just don't have any. I already had the four 8 gig dims and I need 32 gigs for my live streaming machine, which is why I can't put a Dark Rock Pro 3 in there because it blocks the memory. Or at least it does with the Trident Z memory from G-Skill that I already have. Uh, Corsair Vengeance LPX would actually fit under that Dark Rock Pro 3. I don't have 32 gigs of DDR4-3200 Corsair Vengeance LPX, or I could put that in instead. Yes, I know, first world problems. Another alternative, of course, would be to use a different case. One of my favorite standbys is the Corsair Obsidian 750D Full Tower. Now, it's much bigger than this to be sure, but it has no clearance issues for huge, large coolers, for a, two, uh, for a 280, a 360 millimeter cooler, and it really doesn't even cost anymore. Now, it has a different look to it, and it's larger, so not everybody wants that, and that's fine, but honestly, if you really want a huge, uh, large cooler, that would be a good choice. So what do I actually plan to do? Well, if you watch my live streams, you're going to see, I'm gonna keep this the way it is. I'm gonna set it to 4.7 gigahertz, and I'm gonna be perfectly happy with the performance. The reality is it's less than 7% difference, 6.3% to be exact, between 4.7 and 5.0 gigahertz. But that assumes that CPU speed is the limit to your performance. If your graphics card or your RAM or your storage or something else is limiting your games or other application performance, more CPU speed won't help. To be sure, another 6% speed is always nice. If you are CPU limited in whatever you're doing, it can potentially add 6% more speed. In the real world, because of RAM, when you overclock your CPU, nothing else goes faster because your RAM and storage and graphics card you might be looking at two, maybe three frames per second difference in most situations between 4.7 and 5.0 gigahertz. Do you need another two frames per second? Do you wanna mess around with extreme cooling for another two or three frames per second? It's pretty minor, all things considered. Now, as far as non-gaming tasks, again, very minor. You might shave two minutes off a one hour video render, for example, going from 4.7 to 5.0 gigahertz, maybe three minutes if you're lucky. It's a very minor difference, all things considered. So I'm gonna run this at 4.7 and be happy. Hopefully you found this video interesting and useful. Like this video if you like it, share it with your friends if you loved it. Remember to subscribe to my channel with that big huge red button directly below. Questions and comments in the comment section. And as always, check out the links in the video description. The link to the full playlist on this computer will be down there. The links to all the parts will be down there. Amazon and Newegg, those are affiliate links. They support the channel. Wanna see more of this stuff? Please help me out, use those when shopping. I'm greatly appreciative. Thank you so much for watching. I will see you in my next video.